Excellent. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along to today's uh, latest installment in the Opus webinar series. Um, I'm the host for today, Daniel Gould. I'm an MD PhD candidate here in the department. Um, I'd like to start off by giving an acknowledgement to country. So I'm meeting on, on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, I acknowledge the um, and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and also, of course, the any Indigenous people who may be viewing this presentation today. And I also acknowledge that we're meeting from many different locations as we're zooming in. So a couple of housekeeping rules uh, for today's webinar. It's being recorded and the video will be uploaded to our uh, YouTube page. Your videos have been turned off. Um, if you'd like to ask a question at any point, do so in the Q&A box um, and or you can put your hand up um, and we will we can turn on your microphone. There will be a designated Q&A time at the end of Ian's presentation. Um, and just um, keep the questions courteous and polite, obviously. Uh, and if Ian is happy to do so, we can share the slides afterwards, but we'll um, discuss that later. So today we have Ian Inkel, uh, who is a conjoint senior lecturer at the University of Newcastle and a champion of education in his role as the Dean of Education and former president of the Australian Orthopaedic Association. He's an orthopaedic surgeon at the Central Coast Local Health District and uh, specializes in shoulder, wrist and hand surgery. So this is a topic, um, getting onto an orthopedic training program, basically that it generates a lot of interest amongst medical students and trainees. And today, hopefully we can slice through some of the myth and clarify um, what's the reality of the situation. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Um, so uh, yeah, just so you know the topic, the structure of orthopedic surgical training programs and the research requirements involved. Uh, um, I'd first of all like to also acknowledge the Darkingjung people who are the traditional owners on the lands on which I meet today uh, and uh, pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I think uh, what Daniel read out was a few from a few years ago. I'm now a conjoint professor at the University of Newcastle and I'm also uh, a subject coordinator for the graduate programs in surgical education at RACS and University of Melbourne. Um, you mentioned that I work as a district director of surgery for my local health district and do uh, some consulting work for uh, Avant Mutual as well. Probably most important for this uh, talk today is that I was chair of the Federal Training Committee of the AOA from 2011 to 2015, and then became a dean, their first dean of education for the next five years. So over that period, um, we developed a new orthopedic curriculum and training program called AOA 21, and I was a gold champion. Uh, um, and um, the sort of the figurehead for the driving that change that it evolved within the development of, of that as well. So what I was uh, hoping to cover today is I was going to describe the structure of the current training program because it is a bit different uh, to a lot of the other specialty training programs in Australia now. Um, it's been adopted, uh, AOA 21 has been adopted by New Zealand. So their training program in orthopedics is almost identical to, to the Australian one. And it's also been looking, looked at by the Finnish uh, Orthopedic Association as adopting that curriculum as well. Um, I'll also then just look at some of the other trends that are occur occurring in orthopedic surgical training programs in the world. Um, and uh, what we'll do is break this up into two sections. So that first section, then we'll stop and have a Q and A about the structure. And then the next part of it, we'll talk about the research requirements of getting into training and also what's required what, what, when uh, people are actually in the orthopedic training program. Um, so first of all, what's Australian training like? Well, there's, there's a, something in education called the tea bag model. And the idea of it is, imagine if you're making a cup of tea, you boil the water, you pop in a tea bag, you wait three minutes, you pull it out and you have a perfect cup of tea. So that's the, the simple time-based production of, a, of a, an output. Um, what we're doing in, a, in Australia and also mostly around the world is moving a little bit away from time-based programs because it does not ensure a, um, an even output 
So our output can be varied. Some people need longer time to train. Some people need shorter time to train. Some people uh, need to take time off training for many different reasons or at least reduce their uh, intensity of training. And so what competency-based um, training uh, is like, the way I like to describe it, it's kind of like this pixelated photo that you can see there. And what we're trying to do is get multiple biopsies or multiple samples of performance throughout training to make sure that the, the performance meets the expected standards that we have for an orthopedic surgeon coming out into practice. Um, now, if you look at that picture now, you, you can maybe guess that there's a human behind the pixels, but you really can't tell a lot about this person. So what we do in competency-based program, instead of having only a few assessments, and in the old program, it would have been, you know, a, a primary surgical primary exam, and then the, primary, the surgical fellowship exam, um, and a few other end of term assessments along the way. Um, instead of doing that, what we're trying to do is get many more um, samples of performance, assessments on performance, to try and give us a better picture. So if you think about that, that's maybe 150 pixels. And you can probably tell now that, yes, that it's a human, and, and maybe you can even tell that it's a female human sitting there. So the more pixels we have, the more samples of performance that we have, we get a better idea or a closer estimate of what reality is in the performance of that particular trainee. Um, and then if you think about this one, which has got thousands and thousands of pixels, we can see that it's Sally, we can see that lots of different things about her that make up that performance. So that's what we're looking at in a competency-based program, trying to get many, many, many samples of performance. And then what that means is also that if one of those pixels is a, is a poor performance, that because it's only one of a thousand, it really is a very low weighted. So it has very little um, impact on the actual outcome of the training. Um, but what we can do is maybe say, okay, well, there's a few, quite a few pixels that are black. Okay, well, that, that means that we, we need to work on that particular area of performance. So it not only is diagnostic, but it helps with remediation because it helps identify where the areas of performance that need to improve are. Whereas with the teabag model, it used to be, you do, when I trained, it was four years of training. You had to pass an exam to get in and you had to pass an exam to get out. And really there was very little else assessment done along the way. And it was just expected you would absorb all this knowledge, attitudes and behaviors and skills, and then suddenly become an orthopedic surgeon at the end of it. So this is, this is the change that's happening. And it's not just happening in Australia, pretty much many places around the world are moving towards competency-based program. It was probably mainly led out of North America in Canada and in Northern Europe as well. So this is what uh, my simple sort of overview of how surgical training has um, evolved. Um, it's, it's pretty much since the start of uh, surgery, it's been an apprentice model. So you work with someone who's an expert or a master in the area uh, learn from them, adopt their habits and behaviours and skills, and then become one of them. So that, that model. Now, only just probably in the last 70 years or so, we actually had a more formalised way to assess whether people have met an uh, accepted standard of performance. And that, that the, the most uh, recognised one is the fellowship examination for surgery and all the different types. Um, more Even more recently, uh, we've decided to look at individual um, time periods of performance. So we do end of term assessments, but these are still, you know, it might include six months worth of behaviors and performance in one, one or two page document. So it really um, is, it's not a very good way of either diagnosing areas of performance to improve, uh, it's not a very good way of providing feedback for improvement in performance. Um, and so more, even more recently, there's been more and more in-training assessments. And many of you as medical students will know about the, um, the mini CEX, um, so mini clinical evaluation examination. Um, and the idea of that is to try and more standardize the way we assess performance and provide feedback, um, but also make it more regular. Um, and that's the main aim of all these different types of assessments. I'm just gonna get rid of this screen in my right corner. Um, and then, yeah, probably since about 2006, 2007 in North America, competency-based training um, began. So that's, that's the way uh, things are going now. There's, there's uh, another 
uh, type of assessment or, or uh, that's involved with competency-based training called programmatic assessment. And it, that's pretty much what I was describing with that pixelated uh, picture. Multiple small biopsies of performance that can allow prov provision of feedback, but then also help uh, if grouped together, look at actually whether the, the benchmark has been met. Um, so what, what was wrong with the apprenticeship model? What do we have to change it? Well, it, um, it, as I said, it's usually a fixed time and everyone learns it at different rates. Everyone may need to delay training or take time off for training for lots of different reasons. So the fixed time period didn't really work very well. Um, we still have a, a time oriented approach because um, as trainees, everyone's employed in a health system and the, the employment periods tend to run for a year or six months. So that's why we have sort of six month blocks of time. Um, but there's no problem with um, adding more blocks of time on or with if you're if the trainee is performing really well, shortening the training time as well. So that's the idea of having that flexible training in, in competency based training. Um, apprenticeship does provide that incremental responsibility. So you do get to do, uh, the trainee does get to do more and more themselves under supervision. Um, and that's in both. The, one of the major problems was uh, with the old apprenticeship model was there was very little transparency, accountability. The high stakes decisions were made by a few people in positions of authority with very little um, transparency around their decisions and very, uh, very little um, uh, understanding from the trainees about what, how those decisions were coming about. Um, the apprenticeship does rely mostly on direct observation. And we know that um, direct observation is much better for higher level performance. Now we can test knowledge in a multiple choice exam, but if we're looking at an interaction between a trainee and a patient, that's very complex. And it really can only be assessed by direct observation by uh, someone who is a master in the area. And one of, the, you know, one of the major downsides of the apprenticeship model is that the people selecting tended to get, select people that looked like themselves. So it's called an affinity bias. So it, it, what it, it does is perpetuate the model of the, the white Anglo-Saxon male surgeon. And so uh, to, to broaden that out, we also want to try and get away from this idea of the, the selection being by a few powerful, important people in surgery. That's the idea of it. So the, 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 some of the major things about the competency-based education is that it has, it has fixed goals and targets on performance rather than fixed time. And, and so that means that we, we, we're aligning the standards to what we believe are the minimum acceptable standards for an orthopedic surgeon in practice. Uh, it uses multiple types of assessment. So uh, direct observation, looking at uh, uh, examination results, uh, interactions, uh, it can involve even patient feedback. Um, it, it, it involves this idea of entrustment. And the idea of entrustment is that, that as training performance improves, more tasks, more trust is placed in that trainee. Um, but it means that there's some evidence behind that entrustment. So we can look at their performance along, a, say, a workplace-based assessment, and then say, well, they perform well in that. We are going to allow them to do that same type of activity without direct supervision, so more distant supervision. So that's the, the whole idea of gradually improve, uh, increasing um, entrustment and, and um, responsibility for performance. Um, another great thing about competency-based education, it really doesn't rely on rely on a, a single surgeon deciding whether this person is passing or failing because it uses lots and lots of trainers input. It means that one trainer who has a personality dis disagreement with the trainee can have very little effect on their overall um, progression through training. So it's a lot fairer for the trainee. It does require a lot more work on the trainers part though. Um, it, it's transparent and it's accountable, as I said. And it, it gains its reliability. Um, if you think about reliability, you want to be able to have a, a repeated measure of the performance. Um, the reliability, reliability comes from multiple samples. So if you have many, many, many assessments, that is more likely that 
the mean or the average of those assessments will be close to the actual performance. So it's a, it's a way of making sure that the, the, the scoring or the decisions made are reflected, reflective of the actual performance. So why do we want flexible training? Well, this, this was from 2013, and more than 50% of females were interested in trying to do flexible training in surgical uh, training in Australia in general. Um, almost all of them at that time were, however, doing full-time training, and only 0.3% um, were managing to do part-time training, which is less than 40 hours per week. Um, and this has been a real push, not only by the College of Surgeons, but by the AOA. Um, and uh, the aim is to have every uh, training position with more than one trainee being able to provide uh, a flexible training environment. Uh, and this is helped by the competency-based training, um, but it's also a requirement to encourage diversity in training. Um, and just as a way of example of this, um, if you look at the performance rates, so this is the American Board of Surgery uh, qualifying examinations. Um, whether the, the, uh, tr whether the um, candidate is uh, partnered, unpartnered or have children doesn't make much difference at all if they're male. But if they're female and unpartnered, their performance um, is much higher. And uh, if they're partnered, their performance drops. And if they have children, their performance drops even more. And I think this, this is a, just a demonstration of the traditional female model of looking after family and, and caring for others. Um, and so uh, this is, if, if for no other reason, this is a reason why we need to also uh, implement better flexible training so that we can get those these females that are obviously great performers, but take it, take away or help to, to manage some of those other stresses involved. It, there's a lot of other fa factors in culture about this. So, so it's not something that the just flexible training will fix, but at least it's going in the right direction. Um, there's a number of expectations about competency-based training. Um, it needs trainee drip drive and the trainees need to drive their own learning. They need to create their electronic portfolios. They need to provide the evidence to the trainers of their performance. So it's much more, uh, it requires much more engagement um, from both the trainee and the trainer compared to the old apprenticeship model. It needs a lot of support because of gathering all this data. Um, and it also needs robust evaluation. We need, if we're going to introduce these new forms of training or new ways of training, then we need to decide whether they actually are giving us better outcomes. Um, and so the AOA is, is in the process of reviewing the AOA 21 training program, which began for everyone in 2017. Um, so that's really important. Um, really important that the trainer participates in the assessment. So lots and lots of trainers, that idea of multiple biopsies. And we need some allocated time available for trainers to actually um, to do this training of, of the trainees. So that, that comes up in, in accreditation of hospital positions and training posts. Um, uh, it certainly meant a lot of faculty development for trainers. So moving from their, their way of thinking from that apprenticeship model to a competency-based model. And to, and to gain engagement, we also need to recognise the efforts that they're making and, and recognise excellence in, in the work that they do. So this is the AOA 21 program. Um, as I say, it was, in, it was developed from 2013 to 2017, implemented for all new intake in 2017. So our first cohort intake into the AOA 20 program are just coming out uh, the other end of training in, the, in this year or next year. And the, one of the major aims of the AOA 21 program was to reprioritize the curriculum to make it much more focused on these foundation competencies down the bottom. Um, it, they're called intrinsic roles in CanMeds in Canada. Um, and sometimes they're called non-technical skills, but that sort of downplays, it's a type of deficit language that we're trying to get away from because we believe that the, these things like communication and teamwork and professionalism are much more important for patient outcomes, uh, much more important to be assessed for patient outcomes than the simple technical medical uh, uh, expertise type skills. So the idea of the curriculum is it heavily focuses on the foundation competencies. We then look at medical surgical expertise in general, and then look at the different areas of the body and different uh, systems or like trauma uh, and injury. 
Um, so that's an overview of that of the curriculum. And the way it sort of looks is uh, people progressing from the left end of the training program. Um, usually they'll do a few years within the hospital system as interns, residents, junior registrars. <clears throat> They need a basic uh, exposure to orthopedic during that time and also need to get their primary examination or what's now called the general surgical science exam. Um, and that needs to be achieved before application um, uh, to the training program. And once people are in the training program, it's really now broken up into three main sections. So this idea of introduction to orthopedics, um, which you can see there's some, still some time frames there but we're trying to get away from timeframes. Most people will do introduction to orthopedics in a 12 month period, but it is possible to, to, to reduce the intensity of work, have flexible training and take it out to two years. Um, and you can see listed down below there, all the different ways we assessed um, performance during that time. And it's mostly focused on gaining trauma competency um, as well as making sure the communication skills, professionalism are all embedded then so nice and early in the program. Um, there's a hurdle which um, uh, is done by an independent review committee and to move from introduction to orthopedics into core orthopedics. And then through the core orthopedics, that um, really is the, um, the main bulk of the, the learning in orthopedics. Uh, and that's every six months moving to a different training post, different hospital, different exposure to different parts of orthopedic surgery. And the idea is through that time, you move through areas where you may do spine, hand and hip and knee and all those different areas. Um, you work through that, uh, those workplace-based assessments again. We look at log books regarding surgical exposure. Um, and also the fellowship examination is more in that central part of training rather than at the end of training like it used to be. There's another hurdle um, assessment done by an independent review panel. And then there's a period um, called transition to practice. And this is mainly trying to stop this. You finish training on a Friday as a, as a trainee and on a Monday, you're suddenly a consultant. Um, so the idea is to make, to, to stretch that period out, make it a more controlled transition to becoming a consultant. And so the assessments during that time are more like ongoing, uh, continuing professional development that surgeons, you know, continue to do. Um, it also gives them time to, to finish off the research project and, um, uh, and then there's a final review of eligibility and then bestowment of the fellowship and the the training program is finished. But as we know, surgical training, it's a lifelong exposure. There's always new things to learn, new ways to improve. Um, and these are the different modules. So all of these um, in the different areas um, uh, need to be completed before sign off to become a fellow of the, the College of Surgeons. Um, and uh, five of these need to be completed before you're able to um, uh, uh, so attend the fellowship examination. Um, so uh, certainly don't know all of them don't have to be completed before sitting the final exam. Um, and as I said, a, because there's so much information coming in, there's a real need to capture this data. So we have, we've developed a training program app, app which is a smartphone based thing. It looks at the workplace based assessments. There's four different types. <coughs> looks at uh, the surgical logbook, so the procedure and the, the level of autonomy in those procedures. Um, and it also uh, captures feedback entries, which are small snippets of performance that have no weighting, but they give an idea of, um, of uh, where areas are to improve and also prompt that idea of feedback. And we can look at the performance of an individual trainee over time uh, with that uh, bar graph. Uh, and AOA has also developed quite a comprehensive learning management system with resources, recorded uh, webinars um, uh, that's available for trainees. Just quickly on some of the international trends and then we might um, stop and see if there's any questions. Um, certainly, as I said before, it's much becoming much more competency-based rather than time-based training. That idea of programmatic assessment, so multiple small assessments, each of which have very low weight, but when combined together, 
it makes it easier to uh, remediate and also um, easier to make heavy weighted decisions. Um, we, there's a move away from using certain number of surgical procedures as a, as a proxy for uh, competence to actual direct assessment of competence. So, so looking at actual performance of a hip replacement, for example, rather than saying, okay, you've done hip tendon replacements, you should be fine at them. Um, so that's, that's a trend that's changing um, around the world. Um, in Australia, we don't still use very much simulation in our surgical training, but certainly in North America and in Europe, uh, simulation is heavily used. And I think that's probably going to come, become more and more in Australian training as well. Um, uh, as I said, that increased focus on intrinsic roles, so that those foundation competencies that I talked about before. Um, certainly some orthopedic training programs around the world take an intake, intake directly from medical schools. And that, that is one of the criticisms made of, of Australia and the UK and that people um, will spend years often waiting to get into a training program. Whereas um, in Canada and uh, the US, they're taken straight from university, medical schools into a training program, come out much earlier. And there's pros and cons with that, but certainly it, it's good to get people through training as quickly as possible whilst maintaining the standard that we require. Um, it's also part, there's, there's varied demand for training positions around the world. So for example, Canada has really usually only a few more applicants than available positions in orthopedic surgery. Um, Australia, and this is a, a very important point to take away if you're a medical student listening, um, is that we have five applicants for every position each year. Um, and so it, it's very highly contested getting into orthopedic training in Australia. Um, there's a number of factors why that has occurred, but I can't see that changing any time in the near future. So we might just uh, stop there and see if there's any questions that uh, we need to go to. Um, can't see any there, Daniel, there's uh, nothing coming in. Uh, no, but we do, no, nothing in the Q&A box, but we do have somebody in the, uh, who has raised their hand for a question. Um, I will just, Manny, is it all right if I let them yeah, let Michelle talk. Um, oh, yeah. The individual with the number, could you just please rename yourself so that we can yeah. properly address you? Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, I'll just... Michelle, you're on, or whoever in the room wants to ask a question. Hi, Ian. Um, just a couple of questions. Just uh, They were just curiosities that came up while you were um, presenting. Sure. New Zealand being the training being the same, has there been any thought ever around sort of removing that border and having a program that runs internationally? Um, well, I guess, I guess the background to that is that once you gain a fellowship in Australia or New Zealand, you can work in either country. There's no restrictions. Right. So even though you might train in New Zealand, you can come yeah. to Australia you know, on the Monday after you finish training and work as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon in Australia. Yeah. Um, is there any um, desire to mix? There, there, we have discussed this over the years. More so, not, not so much blending them, the two countries completely, yeah. but maybe consideration for bringing a, a New Zealand trainee or two over to, to Australia for six months, sort of an exchange program more yeah. than having it completely blended. Um, the, probably the biggest barrier to, to really blending the two training programs is the, the different employment systems. Right. Um, so being employed in New Zealand, there's lots of different things about that to being employed in Australia. So, so that'd be a, a, a hurdle to overcome. I'm not saying it's not impossible, but... Um, but yeah, just, um, so that, that, that's one of them. Um, but yeah, the, the New Zealand program is basically AOA 21, yeah. renamed New Zealand Orthopedic Training. They haven't really changed anything involved in it. So it, the, the two are almost identical. And the, one of the reasons we need to do that is that the, the, the fellowship examination, which we use, is done by both countries as well. So they sit the same examination. Because um, like I'm aware of that situation where there's, you know, five applicants for every position. And I just wondered whether 
that may be, I don't know if the, the situation in New Zealand or elsewhere that uses the same education program. It, you know, you're saying that Canada doesn't have, you know, this problem of way more interest than um, positions. So whether that would in some way help with that. That was just why I asked well, the question. But. There, there have been trainees that haven't been um, successful in Australia and they've, uh, some of them have actually gone to Canada and trained. There's not many. Yeah. Um, the, the difficulty then is that you have a fellowship from a different training program that you would then need to apply for comparability in Australia yeah. because just because the training programs are different. Um, and so that would be a hurdle about people training in Canada and then coming to Australia as well. Um, as far as the numbers, it, look, it's partly related to the availability of jobs in Canada. There really aren't many orthopedic surgery jobs in Canada and 20 or 30% of their trainees, pretty much as soon as they finish training, go straight to the US to work because they, they can't get jobs in Canada. So that's probably at least part of the reason why they don't get many people applying. Um, I just you have said one you more. had a second question? Yeah, I do. Um, I was just interested in how the transition was managed. Um, I know you say the first cohort are just about to come out, but did you kind of have to run two training programs while one season yeah. end or? We did, yeah. For procedural fairness, we needed to, if we, the people that we had already in, had in training, we needed to continue the training as promised. So we, yes, we did have to run two parallel programs for a few years. Um, what we did, however, though, is um, talk to them about the assessments that were done in AOA 21, so these multiple workplace-based assessments, and there was universal agreement from the people in the program currently that they thought the assessments were a good thing. So they all moved to using the same assessment processes, but their timelines were a bit different and some of the other requirements were different. Um, um, but but um, now... The ones in the previous program, I think they're pretty much all finished now. So it's just AOA 21. So we got through that transition. Interesting to see the, um, the data that comes out. We've certainly got a lot of data um, about performance, about uh, we, one, of the, one of the KPIs, one of the benchmarks we're going to look at is their performance of fellowship examinations, uh, the performance after entering practice, things like that, to, to try and see whether we've made a difference. Like we, we're following good evidence-based principles in education, um, but the proof will be in, you know, are we producing better, safer surgeons? Um, and that's the aim of it. And, and also being more flexible about how we do it. I see there's a couple of questions in the Q&A now. Yeah, we'll just go to Anne Smith first. So I'll just um, open up okay. Um Hi. Thanks, Daniel. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Is no, not, not a problem. Identifying me. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. That was fantastic. So interesting to see that process and this, this move. Um, I just had a couple of uh, questions in terms of, you know how you were saying the proof will be in the pudding of evaluating outcomes in terms of better and safer mm. surgeons. What will be the metrics for that? Uh, that the AI yeah, that's a... It's yeah, great question. It's as you probably know, Anne. It's very hard to me to to tie in performance during training and patient yeah. outcomes later on. Very hard to do that. There, there was a really nice study done in obstetrics and gynaecology, looking at ONG trainees and then looking at their um, rates of complications in their practices ten years after training and. And that's the kind of thing that we'd have to be looking at. So we'd look at very long-term um, outcomes, but look at performance on uh, rates of complications, uh, like reoperation rates, infection rates, things like that, yeah. and see whether we can tie that back in. And, and very, you know, it, it might be useful that because we have something called the National Joint Replacement Registry. We can look at every joint replacement that's performed in Australia and the outcomes of those. Yeah. And yeah. it may well be in the future that we can actually correlate that with performance during training and see if there's actually a, a correlation or not. Sure. It was partly I was thoughtful about um, uh, evidence-based guidelines for particular types of surgery and whether there was more adherence to those as a result of this training. Is that something they're potentially looking at? 
that that is has been discussed. Um, there's yeah. like, there's four pages of potential um, <laughs> things. You know, we, I think at the moment we've got lots of ideas about ways that we can actually yeah. find out whether we have made a difference or not. Yeah, um, but I, it's still very early days. It's so difficult, isn't it? To um, it like is. even to evaluate adherence to guidelines is really difficult. Yeah, in the, out in the real world. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just Daniel, had... we might. Yeah, sorry, Anne, you had another one. Oh, I just was interested in your foundational competencies like communication and so forth. I know you've been doing a lot of work there. Are, are there similar um, uh, goals in some of the other um, training programs yeah. across um, medicine? So and, and can you combine, do you combine with them at all or is it just particularly um, uh, specific to orthopaedic surgeons for, for those no, aspects? No. Um, so, so I guess the first part answer would be that yes the college of surgeons has developed a professionalism curriculum um, right. and that's you know deliberately aimed at trying to improve the skills of communication teamwork and professionalism okay. um, so that will apply to all of the other surgical specialties some of the some of the training that we do so our training and professional skills course is available for all the surgical specialties under the college of surgeons but also is available for ophthalmologists and O and G. So, so there's some cross pollination there between specialties yep. in the training side of things rather than the assessment side of things. Great. Um, certainly, a, a number of the other specialties are interested in what we've been doing in AOA 21, and they're also developing. So, I think emergency uh, plastic surgery there, they sort of doing the same evolution work that we're doing. So, they're, they're um, interested in how we've sort of implemented it and, and the changes we've made. Yeah, that's for sure. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. No problems. Daniel, we might just take one more question and then I'll go on to selection, I think. Sure, no worries. Um, so I'll just go to Sam Bunsley's first question. So now that communication is one of the foundational competencies, are you able to tell us how communication is taught and how this competency is assessed? Oh, good question, Sam. <laughs> um, it's assessed. So the communication is mostly assessed through our workplace-based assessments. So we have four workplace-based assessments done by a trainer with a trainee. Uh, usually it's pre, or it is, it is pre-organized. Um, so, okay, today there'll be this patient that you're going to see. Well, let's do a workplace-based assessment on it. And it provides uh, different, uh, it's, it provides a rubric to say, well, these are the standards of performance and where that, the, that particular, along that spectrum, that trainee performed. And, and very clearly, some of those um, primers are directly related to communication skills. So that's how we're assessing the communication. How are we teaching it? Well, we have face-to-face -face teaching from our trainers in hospital is probably the most important way we teach it and the role modeling that they provide. Um, but we also do, um, so there's a course I just mentioned, training and professional skills, which is heavily um, uh, weighted around communication in teams, communication with patients. Um, so, so that's that's uh, trying to address at least some of the delivery or, or, or teaching side of the communication. But most of it would be done by our role models and our trainers within the hospitals. Excellent. So, do you want to leave the rest of the questions for later and move on? To part I think we might just leave them. I, I just want to get through the selection side of thing because I can see it's twelve forty three, and I and I would know we can't run over time. Sure, not so a problem. I'll just um, go back to sharing the screen and move on. So just to, uh, hopefully this will only take about 10 minutes. So the research requirements for selection into the AOA 21 program are, are probably a lot different to what uh, has been around in the past. So this is just sort of the flow um, that happens in selection. So first of all, there's some College of Surgeons eligibility requirements. So that's citizenship, registration, those sort of things, working with children checks. Um, then there's an application that comes to the AOA and the AOA really then looks after all the selection uh, from then on. Um, and what we do is we have some minimum eligibility requirements, which I'll get to in a sec. And we do CV marking. So we, we uh, allocate scores for the CV. Um, from then, we move to referee reports, which are taken from the hospitals where the applicant has worked. And um, out of those, um, we move then to invitations for interview. I mean, in the past, we maybe only interviewed 50% of the people applying. 
But now it's more like 80 or 90% because we've realized that our interview is our most uh, reliable and valid tool um, for selection. Uh, and the interviews are done nation nationally. We have a final ranking and then we look at which particular uh, regions that the applicants want to train in and allocate them out to the available training positions. And, and AOA has accredited training positions in every state. And what we also do is fill every training position we have. So we're not trying to restrict numbers. We're just making sure that there's a basic minimum standard of training available before we would, would accredit a training program. So all this happens between February and June. Offers are made late June, early July for commencement, usually in February of the next year. But because it's a much more flexible training, we do then some point some people to begin in July of the following year as well. Um, so uh, it, it, there is possibility to delay starts or to be a little more, more flexible at how people are allocated to training. Um, so the, the place to go is go to the AOA website, aoa.org.au, and you'll be able to find under training these regulations which are published every year. And, and, and one word of warning, they do change from year to year. So make sure you get the most current available regulations because they're the ones that will be being applied. And what this graph on the right shows is how the weighting has evolved in our selection for training. So back in 2007, we had about 25% of the overall selection score came from CV. About another 35% came from referee reports and 40% came from interview. And you can see over time what's happened is we've gradually decreased the power of the CV score and then more recently decrease the power of the referee report score so that the majority of our selection process is done on interview. And we've done that deliberately, um, both from the evidence in the literature about the uh, reliability and validity of those tools, um, but also of our own experience of those tools and how uh, some of them can be gamed and some of them uh, are not good indicators of later performance during training. So that, that's um, the, the why the, uh, it happens now. So you can see that in 2019 and, and currently, the CV score doesn't contribute at all to a selection score. What it is, there's a minimum CV score that needs to be obtained before you'll be able to get into the selection process or you, before you'll be able to progress in the selection process. So that's the way it works now. Um, and so this is just a sort of a summary. Um, you can see we've talked about somewhere here about can meds. This is because this was a slide that I prepared for a, a Canadian presentation. Um, but these are, these are the, um, the areas where we score the scoring. Again, I think this might have been taken from 2021's regulation. So don't, don't take a screenshot of this. Go to the current regulations if you're interested in applying or thinking about applying. But what there is is, a, is, a, is we do require some um, research experience or presentation experience courses, but, but the, there is only a minimum required score of six points. So it can be obtained in a number of different ways. Um, and then it's really then the referee reports and the interviews which go towards um, the selection process. Um, so let's, let's assume you've just started in training. What do you have to do now? So in the past, you had to present at a national meeting or have a publication done um, by the end of training or to be able to sit the fellowship examination. So you, usually that was in the last year of training. Um, so it's changed a lot now. What we wanted to do was make it, again, more flexible. So there's three main choices now, three pathways. So one's a project called a project pathway, a coursework pathway and a PhD pathway. And I'll explain those in, in a second. Um, We've, we've been very deliberate about saying that people can collaborate in research components because we know collaboration is very important for quality research. Um, and we also wanted to really support those surgeons, people that wanted to be surgeon scientists. So the people that wanted to do a PhD and, and be heavily involved in research as well as providing surgical care. Um, another newer thing that we're doing is we're actually recognizing prior learning in research experience, um, which uh, means that you know if you've already come come through a PhD, applying to orthopedic training, you won't need to go through these sort of things anymore. Um, 
So the project pathway, the idea of this is, is, is participation in a number of aspects of a major research component. And up to three trainees can collaborate on the project. So they usually be collab collaborating with other surgeons or supervisors. Um, and it must be directly relevant to orthopedic surgery, that research, um, the project pathway. Um, there's five major components that we look at and there needs to be um, a contribution into a number of these components by the participants. Um, and although it may not have been accepted for publication, it needs to be assessed to be of a publishable standard um, with the aim that almost all of these should eventually get to publication. Um, and the idea is that it should also be presented at an uh, uh, annual scientific meeting as well. So that's, you know, just doing the research. So the Coursework Parkway, the idea of this is that we, it, we understand that some people really just don't, don't want to do very much research, but we want we do want research uh, literacy. Um, so the aim of the coursework pathway is to do a number of subjects that are very useful um, to understand research outcomes and, and, and publications, um, and then do a smaller project. Um, so the idea of this pathway is that uh, a course may be identified, let's say a graduate diploma, graduate certificate, even a master's um, application is made to the AOA to say, I would like to do this course as part of my research requirements. Uh, we look at the course and either approve or suggest modifications. Um, so that's a prospective thing. And then the second part of that is there still needs to be some participation in a small research program. Again, it can be a collaborative approach um, and the, the standards that that's held to are a little bit less onerous than the project pathway. And the final one is that surgeon scientist idea, the PhD pathway. Um, and this is, this is for people that are identified early on that they say, yes, really interested in research, really want to get involved in this. So we would create training posts or we have created training posts in the major research hospitals, uh, like St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, um, to uh, provide some clinical exposure, so the training can still go on for surgery, but also working with a uh, in a PhD uh, type environment. So uh, gaining that uh, qualification during training. It might mean that training is extended a little bit in time, um, but it means that a surgeon can then come out both with an orthopedic fellowship and with their PhD, and that kickstarts their research career. Um, and a number of our trainees have already started, uh, already done or commenced that. Um, and as I mentioned before, there is definitely recognition of prior learning, but it does have to be within the last five years. And it needs to be something real, reasonably relevant to orthopedic surgery uh, and have been presented as well. Um, so that sort of sums up where we are at the moment. So again, happy to take some more questions there. I see we've got about five more minutes. Um, Excellent. So. Uh, Yep. Okay, uh, I can see there Ver Veronique's ask, uh, could you briefly offer a reason or two why we have so many more applicants and positions in Australia? Well, um, uh, that the one reason I said about Canada or about the lack of jobs after training, uh, Australia relative to many other countries, orthopedic surgeons are very well remunerated. Um, and I think that is a significant factor. Um, the, the number of training positions that we have is, is partly related to the workforce requirements as um, considered by government. Um, and so the training numbers are targeting, trying to maintain the appropriate level of uh, orthopedic surgeons provisions in Australia um, without training too many, because we know if we've trained too many, they'll, they, they, the the amount of unnecessary surgery goes up and the cost of care go up. Um, so I think that's probably the main ones. And, and, you know, I'm a bit biased. I think orthopedics is a fantastic training program. So a lot of people just want to do that for that reason alone. <laughs> um, Sam Bunsley says, with the transition to the competency-based program, have you seen more diversity in the people entering the program? Um, 
there's more flexibility. There was more flexibility, or flexibility was improving even before we transitioned to AOA 21. So I think there's been improvement over the last 10 years at least. We've seen a gradual increase in the proportion, and I know diversity is much bigger than this, but we've seen an increase in proportion of the number of, uh, of the um, females or those identif that identify as females coming into orthopedic training. And it's currently, it was 30% of the intake last year was um, female. Our aim is to try and get that to similar to what's coming out of medical school, which is about 55% female. But um, we, should, we should be making sure that there are no barriers to uh, females, uh, other types of diversity um, coming into orthopedic surgery, because we know that that will imp actually improve the overall care for patients because uh, communities are better cared for by um, doctors that actually represent or come from those communities. Um, so yes, I think there has been improvement. Um, we've been deliberately targeting what we do in selection as well. So making sure that we have better diversity on our interview panels and having um, uh, questions that are more aligned with um, in, in, or uh, sort of assisting diversity, uh, at least making sure that uh, we're trying to remove any barriers against it. Um, so a question there from Isaac. Uh, someone starting internship from next year, what are some tips you would give to make the most out of my intern year as a surgically oriented student? Assume that once you're HMO2+, plus, your preset society can assist you more directly. But what can I be doing as an intern? Okay, great question, Isaac. Um, as an intern, I would normally, what we normally would recommend you try and do a, if you're interested in orthopedics, try and get an orthopedic term. So usually it's five terms in internship uh, of 10 weeks. Um, try and get an orthopedic uh, term if you can. Certainly get a surgical term of some sort. Uh, but I would also really highly recommend that, that ICU terms, anesthetic terms, emergency terms, are all really important because a lot of the, the acute management of trauma are more closely related to those specialties than they are actually to, to surgery. Um, so, so we would we um, require as part of uh, your experience before coming into orthopedic training that you've done an emergency term, that you've done an ICU term, things like that. So you can get those in earlier, then that sort of opens up your, your choices later on in your, your next year or two. Um, other tips about making it? Hmm. I don't know, I'll have to think about that a bit more. Um, another question from Veronique, uh, another question. Uh, it's juicy, but what is AOA's stance on gender quotas? Great question, Veronique. Okay, so just as a sort of a background, the College of Surgeons, Royal Australasian College of Surgeons uh, does have gender targets. Um, AOA has deliberately not set quotas. Um, and, and that's been over many years, we've had discussions and, and looked at the evidence behind this. And whilst it may be necessary to eventually introduce quotas, um, there's many other ways that we can improve or increase um, representation from underrepresented minorities. Um, and so we'll, we are actively diversifying our interview panels. We're actively um, trying to remove all the barriers to getting, um, and we were, we've done some research on looking at what are the barriers to actually getting to interview. Um, we, so we're trying to work on all of those. Um, but I think, yeah, if, if in three years time or four years time and all of those things have happened and we still have a problem with diversity, then quotas have to be discussed again. There's there's lots of arguments on both sides of establishing diversity quotas. Um, and at the moment, we, uh, you know, one swallow doesn't make a spring. We've had 30% intake of females this year. We would hope that that would continue and even increase over the next few years due to the things that we've put in place so far. Um, Right, another, this might have to be the last question, I think, Daniel. Um, from Isaac, uh, told about AOA outreach aboard from a surgeon in my hospital. Is that something for trainees only or JMOs? Um, so orthopedic outreach is a program where surgeons go to underdeveloped countries and uh, help provide surgical care, but also provide education for surgeons in the local areas. Um, and a lot of Pacific Island countries, some African countries, um, that individual surgeons go to. Participating in one of those visits, I think would be a, a life-changing experience for many people. 
Um, and it's certainly available to be done as a junior doctor. But our, we've certainly encouraged our trainees to do it as well. It's just that as a junior doctor, you probably won't be undertaking as much of the surgery, but you can certainly be participating as an assistant and, and look at, you know, help look at, you know, what are the factors involved in providing care in those resource poor areas. Um, so certainly recommend it. The, the name of the organisation is Orthopaedic Outreach and you can contact them through the AOA website as well. Um, there's other groups like Interplus that do plastic surgery. There's, um, they provide education as well. Um, so, and I think the College of Surgeons also has a, um, an overseas outreach program as well. But I know more about the orthopedic one. Anyway, it's one o'clock, Daniel. Excellent. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, great presentation. I think that made everything very clear um, for the students. And I'll make sure we spread this around on the YouTube channel. Um, just like to also mention to everybody that Ian is a presenter at both uh, Soma Day and the Opus Forum. So Soma Day is just the first day of the Opus Forum, which is coming up from July 1st to 4th. Make sure you get your tickets at the Opus website. And we look forward to seeing you there. Um, yeah, thanks again, Ian. My pleasure. And um, thanks everyone for listening. And I'll, I'll, we'll provide the slides for you. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Okay. See you later.